Well, good morning. I want to invite you to open in your New Testament to Titus chapter 2. <clears throat> Titus chapter 2. That's where we're going to spend most of our time this morning, so I want to place a marker there. We'll, we'll bounce around a little bit, but this will be our text for this morning. Someone has said that secularism, the concept of secularism, basically entails a religious commitment to this world. I don't know if that's a perfect definition, but I want to tell you what, it gets fairly close to what it's all about. The secular mind views the affairs and the, the things of this world as the basis and as the goal of life. And it's a mindset that is indifferent and, and sometimes reaches even to the point of being opposed to living a life that puts God first. We see it really all around us in our world today. You know, I don't have to tell you that we live in a secular society because you already know that. And I also don't have to tell you that it's not always easy to be a Christian in a society like ours. The truth is we, we face a number of difficulties, and sometimes uh, we find that it's difficult to get people to listen to the gospel and, and to respond to the gospel. You, you may at times hear people say things like, you know, folks just aren't interested in the gospel. And whether that's true or not, I don't know that it is entirely so, but it certainly feels that way sometimes, doesn't it? At, at other times, the problem we face is not in getting someone to, to become a Christian, to choose to obey the gospel of Christ. It's in getting someone who has become a Christian to live like one. You might think we shouldn't have to tell Christians to, to act like Christians, but we do sometimes. We see that they did in the first century. That's what we read in the various letters that Paul and others wrote. And that's because it's often easier to get people to enter the church, that is to, to become Christians, than it is to get them to leave the world. And so we see sometimes new Christians bring into the church some of the lifestyle that they learned while in the world. And that's because becoming a Christian doesn't take away every problem that we face or every temptation that, uh, that comes our way. And so, so people sometimes struggle. They still wrestle with certain attitudes and wrestle with certain attractions and still wrestle with certain activities that they profess to have left. And that's precisely what Titus was dealing with as Paul wrote to him while he was working on the island of Crete. He was dealing with Christians primarily, but the problem was that they were acting more like Cretans. And I want to point out that the Apostle Paul, when you read what he wrote to, to Titus, it's clear that he believed that it was possible to get the world out of the church. And so in our text, Paul will talk about the, the foundation for godly living. You know, why should God's people live lives that are characterized by things like righteousness and godliness? Why is that? And the answer Paul is going to tell us <clears throat> is found in connection with two appearances. And so let's begin reading Titus chapter, chapter 2, verses 11 and following. He says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. And so what I want us to do is we, we talk about this passage. I just want to break them down into the, the two appearances he talks about here. And the first appearance that Paul talked about is the appearance of God's grace. He says there again in verse 11, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. You ever wondered what exactly Paul was talking about in, the, in this verse? How, how exactly did the grace of God appear? Well, what I think Paul's talking about here is the fact that the grace of God appeared in the person of Jesus Christ when he came into this world. You see, for example, in John chapter 1 and verse 14, John would say that the, the word became flesh. He's talking about Jesus. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory, glories of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth, he would say. 
Or in that same chapter, a couple of verses later, in John 1, verse 17, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus, when he came into the world, what he demonstrated. Those, those qualities, the one we're talking about this morning, of course, is grace. And yet Paul not only tells us about the fact that God's grace appears, he, he also gives us a couple of reasons why the grace of God appeared. And the first thing he says is that the grace of God appeared to, to bring salvation. Another way of putting that is to say that, that Christ came into the world to save people from their sins. And that plan to save mankind, that, that was God's initiative. It was not ours. We couldn't have dreamed it up. And one thing that is at least implied when Paul said that the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation, is that salvation did not originate with mankind. The grace of God showed up, as it were. It appeared to us. Paul said that salvation is a result of God's work. In the passage that we, yeah, we, we read at the beginning of, the, of our worship this morning that Greg read in 2 Timothy chapter 1, and verses 9 and 10, really kind of encapsulates the ideas that we're talking about this morning. Paul said that salvation is the result of God's own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which has now been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus. That's the same, same principle we're talking about there. Paul does that a lot. He'll bring up in a different letter a concept he has talked about in another, and it kind of sheds light on each other, and that's, that's, that's beneficial to us. But salvation is from God through Jesus. And, and this salvation that God has provided, of course, is as universal as the need. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, Paul says. Some translations may read a little bit differently than that, but I think the English Standard Version captures the, captures the gist of this passage best. The grace of God is capable of saving everyone. And that's precisely what everyone needs. They need the salvation that is available in Christ. If you recall, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 would say that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's just a fact. It's just reality. All have sinned. And the great need of mankind is to be saved from that sin. Not everybody in our world recognizes that. But every in, everybody in our world needs that. And so in Christ, what Paul's telling us is that that salvation has been provided. That's the only place it's been provided. As the writer of Hebrews would say in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, he said, we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. That's what Jesus did. He came into the world and through his death... He makes it possible for us to be right with God. And, and when Paul talks about the fact that the grace of God has appeared in bringing salvation for all people, he, he wasn't saying by that that everyone will be saved. That's not the point. You can't read the rest of the scriptures and, and come to that conclusion. But what it does mean is that anyone can be saved. It doesn't mean that there, it means there are no limitations on that. Then this, you know, this group of people over here, it's, it's open to them and available. But this other group over here, it's not so. It means that it's available to everybody. It means that if you're not forgiven of your sins, <coughs> it's not because God hasn't made provision for that. He's made provision for the salvation of all mankind through the death of Jesus. But let me also point out that salvation wasn't the only reason for the appearance of God's grace. I mean, that's a wonderful benefit. We all need that. But there's something else that Paul says in this passage. <coughs> Excuse me. The second reason Paul gives is to instruct us or to train us. Look at verse 12. Training us, he says, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. You know, there are so many people who seem to believe that, that grace ultimately comes out to be basically a license for sin. That God, because of his grace and the, the, the forgiveness that is available in Jesus, kind of doesn't really treat sin the way that he once did. That, that really, you don't have to be too concerned about those things. Isn't that kind of the mindset that so many people had, have? Not, not everyone believes something like that, but it's clear that there are a lot of people who do. They may not say it in those terms. <coughs> they, may not, they may not put it that way. But you can see it in the way they live their lives. What we need to understand is that that's not what grace does. Paul dealt with that kind of thing in his letter to the Romans, in Romans chapter 6, in the first couple of verses. He would ask the question, what shall we say then? 
are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? He says then in verse 2, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? How can we do that? We're not supposed to do that. It ought to be obvious that God's grace doesn't provide us with a license to go on living that way, to live in sin. It ought to inspire faithfulness. We're told in John chapter 3 and verse 16, <coughs> I promise I want that to go away as much as you do. We're told that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And we're familiar with that passage. What, what it says is that Jesus coming into the world to die for the sins of mankind, that was God's gift. God gave that. He is the grace of God that appeared. He didn't have to do that. He chose to do that. And far from that, giving people a license to live their lives however they may choose, it demands from us a response, a response of love and of loyalty. And so grace wasn't given to grant us the freedom to live ungodly lives without the fear of consequences. That's not what it's about. We weren't freed from our sins so that we might return to the very thing that produced our bondage in the first place. The aim of grace is to create a people who are characterized, Paul says in verse 14, by their zeal for good works. They want to do the right thing. And so in our text, Paul said that grace is actually a means of instructing us or, or training us along those lines. It trains us to renounce ungodliness. It trains us to renounce worldly passions. It teaches us to live self-controlled lives, upright lives, godly lives here and now in the present age, he says. Another translation puts it this way. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. And so that just saying no <coughs> is the instruction of grace. And, and you know, and I, I recognize, we all recognize, there are a lot of things we need to say no to in this world. We live in a society that is dominated by things like ungodliness and worldly desires. But Paul said that it is God's grace that teaches us to say no to those things. There's more to life than our own desires, whatever those desires may be. And contrary to the opinion of the world, the right thing to do in the face of all of that is to just say no. And yet I want you to see in what Paul says here is that God's grace does, it does more than that. Life is not just about saying no, as important as that is. Grace also teaches us to say yes to some things. We're to say yes to self-controlled lives. We're to say yes to being upright and to being godly. We're to say yes to being zealous for good works. We are to be involved in those types of things. Paul says that that's part of the grace of God. That's what Jesus coming into the world and dying for our sins and all of the things associated with that, that is what we are taught in the gospel of Christ. But there's a second appearance that Paul talked about in our text that I want us to look at this morning as well. In verse 13, he talks about the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Talks about the appearing of grace. Talks about the appearing of glory. That's why you get the title that's on the screen. And when Paul spoke first about the grace of God appearing, again, he spoke of it as a past event. The grace of God appeared. It's past. It, it's done. Something that had already taken place at the time that he wrote this letter. But when he speaks of the appearing of the glory of God, it's a future event he has in mind. In fact, it's something we're still looking forward to at this point. It hasn't happened yet. And that event that he's talking about there, I believe, is the second coming of Christ. And what Paul tells us is that Jesus has appeared in grace and that he's going to appear again in glory. And you can see how important the second coming of Christ is when you look at just how often that that. Uh, that event is referred to in the New Testament. Someone has calculated that one out of every 25 verses in the New Testament deals with the return of Jesus. In the 260 chapters of the, of the New Testament, there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 318 references to the return of Christ. I don't, I don't know who counted all of those, I'll be honest with you. But if that figure is anywhere close to being accurate, it, it's impressive. It tells us something about the importance of that event, doesn't it? And I want to remind you this morning that the second coming of Christ is just as sure, it is just as certain as his first coming was. Paul would say there again in verse 13 that we are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of uh, 
the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. When, when the scriptures talk about hope, they don't really mean the same thing that we often do when we talk about hope. Hope has to do with confident expectation. When, when we talk about hope, it's, it's all very often that I, I doubt this is going to happen, but I really would like for it to. That's not how the scriptures use that word. It talks about something that we can, we, can, we, can, uh, we can have confidence in. We can look forward to it. We can expect it to come. And so because of the testimony of a faithful God, we can confidently expect, we can look forward to the day of Jesus' return. The first appearance of Jesus is a matter, matter of historical reality. But his second peer, appearance is a matter of prophetic certainty. You see, in the Bible, prophecy is just as sure as history. It's going to happen. Prophecy is simply history that hasn't been brought to pass yet. So God has seen it. He's planned for it. We haven't, you know, we're waiting for it. But what we see in the New Testament is that it everywhere affirms that Jesus is going to come again. And when Jesus returns, what he is going to do is he's going to bring to completion that which brought him into the world in the first place. Well, when he first came into the world, we're told again, he brought salvation. He came to give himself as a sacrifice for our sins. And when he returns, it will be to bring that salvation to completion. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28, for example, the writer of Hebrews would put it this way. He says, Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. That's what we're talking about. Not to deal with sin. He already did that but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. It's coming back to get us, is the idea. And what makes the second appearance of Christ so remarkable is not just the fact that he's going to appear or even that he's going to appear in glory, although that is remarkable all by itself. What makes it even more remarkable is the fact that we also can appear with him in glory. That's the hope of the child of God. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 14, Paul would put it this way. He says, when Christ who is, is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's your future if you're a child of God. And, and that fact is talked about using different language in different passages, but again, all through the New Testament. Philippians chapter 3, for example, in verses 20 and 21. Paul would say there that our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. That's a remarkable statement. What he said is when Jesus comes, we're going to be changed. And the power that is going to change us is the same power that holds the universe together. That's power. And because Jesus is coming again, what you and I can do is we can live in hope. Paul would talk about that in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. He would talk about Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what it means for Christ to be in you, that you have hope that you look forward to that day, that you can look with great anticipation to the coming of Christ. And as we do that, as we live in this world looking for the return of Jesus and, and waiting for the day when we will share in his glory, we need to allow that fact to have a profound impact on the way we live our lives now. See, that's not just, it. Let's, let's put it off in the future when it comes and it happens, that's all great and good. That's not it. It needs to be the motivation for who we are now. I want you to look at, with me at uh, what the Apostle John would say. 1 John chapter 3. It's one of my favorite passages. 1 John chapter 3, begin with me in verse 1. John says there, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. And the language John uses there doesn't, doesn't it's kind of hard for it to come out in our English translations, but he's, he's expressing astonishment. <clears throat> he's, he's basically saying, look at how marvelous the love that the Father has given to us. He actually calls us his children. That's kind of the idea. 
And then he says after that, that's what we are. He says, the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. And he says in verse 2, beloved, we are God's children. Now, that's who we are if we're Christians. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. And then in verse 3, he takes it a little bit further. He says, and, and everyone who thus hopes in him, everyone who has this hope in him, purifies himself as he is pure. I've often said about verse 3, there are like way too many pronouns in that. Let me, let me state that differently. Everyone who has this hope in Christ purifies himself as Christ is pure. That's the point he's making. And so John says that it's something we've already pointed out. When Jesus appears, we're going to be like him. But that's what we look forward to as Christians, is to be like Jesus. Jesus is going to be revealed in glory. We're going to be re revealed with him in glory. We've seen that. Paul talked about that too. But the thing I want you to notice now is that John points out there in verse 3 that everyone who's looking forward to that, everyone who's, who's thinking that, that's, that's what is waiting me as a child of God, does something to them here. Does something to them now. Everyone who thus hopes in him, everyone who's looking forward to that day, purifies himself as Christ is pure. I've said it this way, you know, many times before. Another way of putting that is to say that everyone who has the hope of being like Christ when he comes is going to strive to be like Christ until he comes. That's what, that's what John is saying. That's certainly God's purpose for us. In Romans chapter 8 and verses 28 and 29. Romans chapter 8. Paul would say, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. And he doesn't mean by that that everything that happens in this world is good. If someone kicks you in the shin, you think, man, that's a good thing. No, that's not it. That's not, that's not how this is. It's because of what the future holds. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, verse 29, to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God's working everything toward that end, to the day when we'll be like Jesus. That's what, that's what Paul's talking about. That's how God works everything towards good. He is bringing it to a conclusion. That conclusion is that those who belong to Christ will be with Christ. They'll be like Christ. John said that those who entertain that hope, that, and, and back in 1 John chapter 3, that they're going to strive to do that now. I'm not going to wait till then. It's like, boy, I can't wait to be like Jesus. Actually, I can. I'm going to live like I want to live now, and I'll be like Jesus then. That's not it. If we don't want to be like him now, do we really want to be like him then? I mean, if that bores us now, if that's not really the kind of life we want now, is that the life we're going to want then? It's not going to be a switch that, that you know, kind of clicks and suddenly we move into that be like Jesus mode. It needs to be our desire now. And so I want to ask you, do you have that hope? Are you living like a person who has the hope of glory? Is it your goal in life to be pure just like Jesus is pure? Does that describe us? If these things describe you, then let me tell you that it'll, it'll affect your priorities. You'll put God first in your life. That's what Jesus did when he was in this world, right? His food was to do the will of his father. He told his, his disciples that when he was at the, at the, you know, had talked with the woman at the well in Samaria. One of the obvious things about Jesus is that he lived his life completely for the will of the father. That's what sustained him, he says. that describe us? Is that what we want more than anything? If you have that hope and you're trying to live like a person who has that hope, then let me tell you, that the way you live your life will be in direct opposition to the world in which we live, to the secular society of which we are a part. Because for the most part, our society thrives on three things. I, me, mine. And God's just kind of left out of the equation. 
Oh, you can kind of put him there on the periphery if you want to do that. He'll be sort of kind of, you know, in the picture, so to speak, as long as he doesn't get in the way of what you want. That's the world we live in, isn't it? And so I want to ask you, will you be different? The two events, the two appearances that Paul described, they form the, form the foundation upon which we as God's children can live our lives and do so in a way that is pleasing to God. The coming of Christ into the world to redeem us from our sins and the promise that he will come again in glory, they are central to the Christian faith. But they are not academic facts. You know, oh, those are, that's interesting, Jesus came and it's interesting he's gonna come again. No, they form the, the basis of how we are to live. Even in the midst of a society that has abandoned God, even in the midst of all of that, so let's learn from God's grace. Let's learn from Jesus. And let's constantly look for the day when he is going to return again. Will you do that? Have you taken advantage of the salvation that is in Christ? Have you been living like someone who has that, that hope of glory? Sometimes we, we don't live that way. Sometimes our, our view is, is squarely on the things of this world. We don't we don't seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, as Paul would say in Colossians. So if we look at all those things, at those questions, we say, you know what, that's not really me. What that says is we need to make some changes. And if there's some way that we can assist you this morning, if you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, that's, this is a good time. This is, this is the day to do that. To commit yourself to being a disciple of Jesus. To, to obey what he says, to, to start with obeying the gospel of Christ because that's where the, that's the beginning place. Jesus said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And we take him at his word when he says that. But if you've done that, and then you haven't lived in such a way as to be like him from that point forward, why not make the decision this morning to make the needed changes? Why not choose to be like Jesus? I suspect we all recognize and we understand that he was the perfect person. There was no sin. There was no deceit. Why would we not want to be like him? So if we can help you in some way this morning, however that is. Again, if you need to obey the gospel of Christ, why not tonight or why not today? If you need to make some changes in your life, we can help you with those. That's why we're here. We're meant to be a family. We're meant to help one another, and that's what we want to do. And so if we can help you in some way, we ask that you come as we stand and as we sing.